Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I want to thank you for being here this morning. We want to look this morning at what the Bible has to say about the Sabbath, the Gospel, and God's rest. As Seventh-day Adventists, people wonder why we keep the Seventh-day Sabbath, when most of the Christian world goes to church on Sunday. Sometimes we are accused of trying to work our way to heaven by keeping the law. Sometimes we're accused of keeping the Jewish Sabbath. But what I want you to see this morning is that as Seventh-day Adventists, you have strong biblical proof and a strong foundation for the gospel and for Sabbath keeping. Amen. The reason behind it. And you need to understand what the reason behind it is. We do not keep the Sabbath because of the law. We keep the Sabbath because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Most Adventists don't know that. And you need to know that because everything that we do and everything that we say needs to be centered on Christ. Amen. For we are Christians. New Testament Christians. I've been accused of being an Old Testament Christian. So let's look at what the scriptures actually say. Turn to Hebrews, what we read this morning. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Therefore, since a promise remains, who's the promise from? You guys understand that, right? The promise is from God. So, there's a promise of a rest. And this promise is from God, and the rest is God's rest. And this is what we as Christians are called to enter into. Christ has died to give us rest. Let all those who are who labor and are heavy laden, come unto me and I will give them what? Yes. What he said there is a parallel verse to what you find here in the book of Hebrews. The question is, is what is this rest that's being spoken of? Therefore, since a promise remains and that promise is from God, and that promise is of entering his rest, that word his, is it capitalized? Yes. yes. So whose rest are we supposed to enter? God's. You guys understand that? It is God's rest that we're supposed to enter. Now, let's keep looking at this. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering His rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have what? Sure. Is that a warning? Yeah. What is the warning? The warning is coming short of entering this rest. This should perk up your ears for being Seventh-day Adventists and for keeping the Sabbath. You keep it because of Christ. You don't keep it because of the law. Paul made it plain that we are no longer under the law, but we are under what? So why do we keep the Sabbath? Because the Sabbath is a symbol of the rest that we find in Jesus Christ. Amen. This is scriptural. This is biblical. Anybody who tells you that you don't have to keep the Sabbath, or why do you keep the Sabbath, you bring them to Hebrews chapter 4, and here is your answer. We keep it because of Christ. That was weak. Amen. That was really weak. Amen. You keep it because of Christ. Amen. Thank you. Stay with me. Let us fear. Now, do you think he's using hyperbole here? No. Or do you think he's giving you some really good counsel? Yes. Let us fear, lest any of us come short of it. Now, in these set of verses, you're going to go through the gospel, the Christian's responsibility in following God, uh, the Sabbath, once saved, always saved, whether that's biblical and true. Okay, now, 
Speaking of once saved, always saved. What does this verse end with? Let us fear lest any of us come short of it. Now you have to go to the last chapter to figure out who came short and why should we fear that we don't make the same mistake. Okay? So let's look at chapter 3. Let's look at verses 12 through 19. Chapter 3, 12 through 19. And chapter 3, verse 12, begins with the word what? Beware. Now again, is he just exaggerating here or is he trying to get your attention? This is serious, so listen and understand. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you a what? Evil An evil heart of unbelief. unbelief. Now, what does the Bible say you must have to please God? Faith. Faith. Faith and belief mm -hmm. go hand in hand, right? So the warning is that there would not be found in any of us an evil heart of unbelief. What is the unbelief that we have to be aware of? We'll continue to look at this. Okay? Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Who is he talking to? Who is, when the writer of Hebrews wrote this, he had a target audience in mind. And he tells you in Hebrews chapter 1 who that target audience is. Do you know who it is? There you go, it's the book of Hebrews, so it's two Hebrews. Who were the Hebrews? Weren't they Jews? Yes. They were Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Is that right? Yes. So he is not talking to unbelievers, he's talking to believers. So if you want to talk about once saved, always saved, why is he warning them to be careful lest there be found in you a heart of unbelief? Is he warning them for their salvation, or is he warning them for their reward? Salvation. Okay. So if he's warning them for salvation, then you can lose your salvation through unbelief. You cannot please God unless you have faith. And Jesus Christ, you have to have faith in him. The whole book of Hebrews was written because Jewish believers were turning back to the sanctuary service and they were leaving the completed work of Christ. And they were going back to the rituals. Is there any salvation found in those rituals anymore? Christ fulfilled them. And so the writer writes to them saying, why do you want to go back to something that no longer has any power? Everything you're looking for is found in Christ. And he tells them that Christ was better than Moses, Christ's ministry was better than the ministry of angels, and that Christ in him, everything is complete. And that's chapters 1 through 3. He gives the example of what happened in the Exodus, when in the wilderness, when they came right to the promised land, they sent in how many spies? Twelve. And it's twelve spies come back after looking at the land, and... How many of them had a good positive report? Two. You know who those two were? Caleb and, Caleb and Joshua. Do you realize out of that generation, those were the only two that actually stepped foot into the promised land? What happened to the rest of that generation? They died in wilderness, right? Because they came back and said, there are giants in the land, we cannot do this. Unbelief. Who didn't they believe in? They didn't believe that God was strong enough or powerful enough to save them. And this is why the writer of Hebrews uses this as an illustration. And he warns, don't let that same evil heart of unbelief be found in you when it comes to your salvation in Christ. So, verse 3, or chapter 3, verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened 
through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 14. For we have become partakers of Christ. What's that next word? Yeah. Is it italicized? No. So it's in the original language. That one little tiny word is very powerful. Isn't that right, Ricky? Amen. That word, if, is in the original language. That word, if, means there's a condition. Right? right? What is the condition that has always been since the fall of Adam and Eve? Obedience. The condition is obedience. Obedience, obedience to who and what? God. God. Obedience to God and His Word. Amen. What He says. Think about this. When it comes to worship, since the fall, it did not take long for there to be a battle between true worship and false worship. The battle that you find in Scripture begins between Cain and Abel. Didn't both of them bring the best of the work of their hands? Yes. But did God only accept one? Yes. Whose sacrifice did God accept? Why? Because, he brought it because Abel was obedient to the instructions in the Word of God. Cain brought the best. Now, see, when I was small, I used to think that Cain brought, you know, the rotten apples and the bad oranges, and he kept the good stuff for himself. But no, Cain brought the best of what he grew. But God didn't say, bring me produce. God made it clear that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And if you want to approach God, you have to do it on His terms, Amen. not yours. Is that right? Amen. And this battle has been going on ever since, and it's going on into our day today. We do not serve a God made in our image, but that is what Christianity is falling into. And you have to be aware and you have to be on guard unless you fall prey to the deceitfulness of sin. Understand that this isn't about your will. It is about submitting your will to following God's will. Amen. That word, if. If you obey. Okay, Ray? We, we don't produce. God is the produce. Amen. Amen. So... For we have become partakers of Christ, what? Yes. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Paul wrote this because the Hebrew Christians were leaving Christ and going back to the temple services. Why were they going back there? Because they were tired of being ostracized in society. They were tired of having their lives be so hard. Okay? And they were going back because if they went to the temple, they fit back into society. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Was it the Jewish society based on what went on in that temple? And when you stepped away from that, don't you think you stood out? That's right. That's right. And so because they were suffering persecution for Christ's sake, they were turning away and going back thinking that they could still find salvation there. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is trying to warn them of. If you step away and lose your confidence in Christ, there is no more salvation that can be given to you because you now have a spirit of unbelief. Not that you were keeping the Sabbath right. You can be forgiven for that. Or any other sin, you can be forgiven for that. But if you lose your confidence in Christ, what more can be done for you? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everything centers on Him. And you step away from that. So if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence, what is the beginning of our confidence? Do you remember what your experience was when you saw who Jesus was? And you gave your heart fully and completely to Him and you were a brand new Christian and you were on fire and you had zeal and you had His love in your heart? 
That's the confidence that you need to hold fast to all the days of your life. What does it tell you that you hold that to? All the way to when? The to the end. While it is said, verse 15, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the what? What rebellion is the writer talking about? Again, this goes back to what happened in the Exodus when God brought them to the foot, to the door of the promised land, and they rebelled against God. Because of unbelief. Now listen. Do you know why their sin was so bad? And why God said, you will not enter my rest. I swore my wrath, you will not enter my rest. Do you know why it was so bad? Where was it? Say it loud, because you got it. They saw it. Where was God at? Right there. Who brought them out of Egypt? With a strong and mighty hand. Who fed them in the wilderness? Who gave them water? Who led them in a pillar of fire at night and in a cloud during the day? The presence of God was right with them every day and they still didn't believe. This is why their sin was so great. Now let me ask you as Christians a question. When you give your heart to Christ, who takes up residence inside of you? So God is with you, just like God was with them. And the very presence is with you, and if you give up your confidence in Him, and you turn your back on Him, what more can be done? So you guys see the association of why the writer gives this Warning so many times in the book of Hebrews. Verse 16 For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now, with whom was he angry? Forty years. Was it not with those who sinned and whose corpses fell in the wilderness? Verse 18 And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? but to those who did not what? Obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Unbelief. Now it goes into chapter 4. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us. Who is the us that the writer is talking about? Is it not the Hebrews that he's writing to? So the gospel was preached to us. Now, now, isn't this interesting? How does it continue on? What does it say? It was also preached to who? Yeah. Who, is, who is the them that it was preached to? Do you understand that the gospel was preached to the Israelites in the desert? How was the gospel preached to them? Yes? If I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. Okay? So listen. Everything that was done for them in the wilderness, every experience they had, was a living example of the gospel. Did they not have the sanctuary service with them all the time? Yes. yes. Well, even before that, he was he preached to them. Now, this just, tell, this just tells you the... the the Hebrews and the Israelites at the Exodus, but let me ask you, Ricky brings up a good point. Those people who lived before the flood, was the gospel preached to them? Yes. How? <clears throat> By God Himself. Let me ask you a question. Why did Cain kill Abel? Because he was mad because God did not accept his worship and his gift, right? Cain sacrificed a what? Start. Abel sacrificed a what? Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. Isn't that the gospel? Okay? Jesus is the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. The gospel was preached to every person 
who has ever lived on this earth from the fall of Adam Amen. to our day today. Okay? So there will be no one who can say, I never heard it. Now listen. Doesn't it say that the apostles in the book of Acts preach the gospel to every living creature? Right? In that time, in their, their place? How come we haven't been able to do that? And, and, and we have so much more technology than they do. The Holy Spirit, exactly. We're not preaching it with power. Okay, so... For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? Because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have, this is verse 3 of chapter 4, for we who have believed do enter that rest. As he has said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, don't you think that's a strange way to end that uh, particular verse. When I first read that over and over and over again years and years ago, I was thinking maybe there was something else that he wrote that was supposed to go in between there. What is he actually talking about? As Adventists, you need to understand this. Okay? So, for we who have believed do enter that rest. This is God's rest. As he had said, I swore that in my wrath they should not enter my wrath or my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What works were finished from the foundation of the world? You have to go to the next verse to find that out. For he has spoken in a certain place of which day? The seventh day in this way. And God did what? This Adventist. This Sabbath keepers is why you keep the Sabbath in the New Testament. This is the text that shows why you should be keeping the Sabbath. And you need to ask your Sunday friends why they don't. Because have them explain to you what does this text mean. Okay? <laughs> what other conclusion can you come to when he's talking about the seventh day? Does it say any day or what of the seventh day? Or one of the days, but it says plainly, specifically what? And it tells you that that day is the rest that we find in Christ. Now let's look at that and I'll explain it to you. Now, the top of verse 3, the beginning, says, For we who have believed do enter that rest. What rest do we enter? The rest that is found in Jesus Christ. This is the rest that God wanted to give the Israelites when he brought them into the promised land. The promised land, Canaan, wasn't the rest. God was the rest. Amen. And they didn't believe. They just wanted a land. God wanted so much more for them. And in Christ, we have so much more. So listen. So he's talking about believers. And he's talking about Christians here. So we Christians who have believed, we do enter that rest. Those who don't believe, God said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That's Psalm 95 verse 11. And then he brings you to this really strange part. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Actually, it's going to be chapter 2. While you're looking for that, let me ask you a question. <coughs> Why did God rest on the seventh day? Was he tired? No. no. Did he need to recharge his batteries? No. Come on, he prayed in this world and... Everything? Don't you think that would wear you out a little bit? Why did he rest? Let's look and let's read the account. So let's go to chapter 1, verse 31, and that's the sixth day. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was what? 
Do you realize that through the story of creation, this is the only time that you read the words very good. Every other day, God saw what he made and it was good. good. But now, he saw what he made after everything was complete and it was what? Very, very good. Why was it very good? Because there was nothing more that could be added. Nothing more he had to do. It was complete. It was perfect. And this is why he rested. Chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were what? Finished. Finished. Was there anything more God needed to do? No. Was there anything that he needed to add? No. Was there anything that wasn't complete? The reason why God rested was because it was complete. Do you understand why the Sabbath is linked as a symbol to salvation in Christ? Why do you rest and why do you enter that rest? Why is the Sabbath a symbol of that? Because in Christ, your salvation is complete. And we rest because we rest in the completeness of Christ. So, as Adventists, why do you keep this day? Because you are resting in the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So those who don't rest on that day, why are you resting on the first day of the week? Answer me that and show me from Scripture. And they will go, um, 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 okay. And they'll give you some explanations, but how do you explain away what's written in Hebrews chapter 4? Because it speaks of this specific day that God rested. Verse 2, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Verse 3, what did God do on this day? He blessed the seventh day. He sanctified it. What does that word sanctify mean? To set apart. Can you show me one text where it says the first day of the week has been set apart, has been sanctified? Show me from the New Testament, because you know, New Testament Christians keep it in honor of Jesus' resurrection. When God set apart, sanctified, and blessed this day, was there a sinner yet upon the earth? No. Right? Was there a Jew? No. no. There was the man and the woman, the mother and the father of all mankind. Do we not all trace our lineage back to Adam and Eve? So when God rested on the seventh day and he gave the seventh day to Adam and Eve, he gave it to mankind. And he never took it away. Didn't Jesus say that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath? Yes. When he uses the word man, he, it's the same word as mankind. Amen. It was to be a blessing for us. Why? Because we find our completeness in God and now in Christ. Amen. Okay, so that's Genesis. Turn back with me to Hebrews. Hopefully you kept your... Uh, your page, because I didn't, so now i got to find it. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 4. <laughs> For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Why does he say this in verse 4? Because of what he ended with in verse 3. For we who have Believe, do enter that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What does that phrase mean? And how does it apply to Christians in the New Testament era? Jesus what I said want you to understand, I'm sorry, go ahead. Jesus said it was finished and then he rested. Okay. Listen. One of the complaints, and it is a valid complaint, and is a valid concern about Seventh-day Adventists, is that we as a people are a people that don't really have an assurance of our salvation. We worry about that investigative judgment because if our name comes up while we're still living and, you know, uh, it goes the 